Farm for Profit Podcast. Take a listen, have a blast. Farm for Profit Podcast. Learn about farming while having a laugh. Farm for Profit Podcast. Hey, this is what we love doing, having some farm for fun on a Thursday. Let's get right into who our guest is today. Turn it out. Well, okay. Today on the Farm for Fun show from the 2023 Husker Harvest Days at the Maya Cornheads booth, we have a we- world traveled man with us. Whoa. He holds a bachelor's in agronomy from Iowa State yeah. University, All right. an MBA from Craig School of Business at California State University. He lived and worked abroad for 11 years and actively farmed in four continents. Wow. Please welcome co founder. Founder of Maya USA. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know. I wanted to know that specific title. Justin Brook. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Welcome. guys. Appreciate, I almost feel like, and, and so that was like a. I'm I'm talking like a 164th of the profile bio. that I bio that I could have went off of there. Mm-hmm. Do I need to call you like doctor or something? No, no, no. no? You do not. Okay, <laughs> I am. I am. What do they say in uh, Caddyshack? I'm just a man that puts just my <laughs> pants on like everybody. Else. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, we're here. That's it's the third day. Very yep. light. Very light traffic, which is which is fine. Perfect weather. Beautiful weather. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Justin, who is you? who are you? Who are you? I mean, like I said, I I, I didn't even touch the surface uh, there. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you the I'll give you the thirty thousand foot view, and we can dip down from okay. there to the twenty right. and the ten. Yeah. So, uh, fifth generation family farmer from Northwest Iowa up at Emmitsburg. Uh, did my bachelor's at Iowa State in two thousand and eight. I had an opportunity to go set up a farm management company in Ukraine, and develop a farm for Morgan Stanley. So, uh, we had a family farm in Brazil. Had met some folks from. Morgan Stanley, they were down there looking at a farm and said, we just bought 40,000 hectares, 100,000 acres of leased land in Ukraine. We're trying to find an American to come farm it, use Western technology, and change the system we got going there. And I thought, I was looking at going to Brazil at the time. I was out in, in California working in the dairy and the feedlot industry. And I decided instead of going to Brazil, I'd go to Ukraine. So I went there in 2008, set up a farm management company. And basically took 7,500 acres that had been fallow since the fall of Soviet Union, 93. Put it into production, imported $2 million worth of used equipment over there, set it all up, and built a farming operation. And then I ended up building a farm management team over there, which we we operated about another 20,000 acres for some Swiss slash Indian investors uh, up the road. And then after the 08 financial crisis, Morgan Stanley who had a lot of money invested in Ukraine and had a lot of corruption issues, ended up liquidating out their farm. And I ended up going to Western Ukraine in Lviv, which sits right along the Polish border outside the Carpathian mountain range. And I had a group there that had about a 12,000 acre farm. They were a publicly traded company out of Stockholm, Sweden, that had about 100,000 acres in the Black Earth region of Russia. And asked me to go over there and basically build a farm for them. And when you farm in Ukraine, there's a large quantity of corruption. So it was the first time I'd come across another American gentleman from Chicago that was there as ultimately the CEO. So I took my farm management team, went in as their COO, and we built a 135,000 acre farm over the next two years. Actually, we, we had, by one point, we had 255,000 acres. Um, and then we went through and basically divested everything that didn't really fit into the hmm. mold where we wanted. So we had a farm down in Crimea of about uh, 15,000 acres. We sold that about 30 days before the Russians actually came and took Crimea. Sold it to the former minister of ag. He paid for it. Either he was in on it or he got totally screwed on the deal. (laughs) But uh, we rode off in the sunset on that one, luckily. And then ultimately I built it into seven farms with seven sets of operators, uh, four agronomists that were trained predominantly in Germany. And each farm had their own set of equipment other than combines. We owned 26 combines, rented 25 combines, and then we would go through and start a canola harvest and go that way and basically work together on a, on a combine harvest process. And so I did that for all the way through 2014. 2012, things started to get uh, rough with the Maidan revolution and then the Crimea invasion. And by 14, it was not the most enjoyable place to carry an American passport and try to farm. We were combining wheat one day. 
I went through seven different checkpoints of people standing around with burning tires and flags and Kalashnikovs hanging over their shoulder wanting to search your vehicle because they were all looking for Russians at the time. And so you just start speaking English and show them an American passport and it was all fine. But I remember one night I said, one of these days someone's going to accidentally shoot me. Yeah. That's been drinking a bottle of vodka since 8 a.m. And also it was time for me to come home. You're eight time zones ahead and it is a uh, mm-hmm. it is an 11 month a year farming when you're growing three different winter crops and three different spring crops. So had the opportunity to come back. I was honestly going to go back to Emmitsburg and farm with my older brother Lance. It was back for a little bit, and a friend of mine who had met at the Morgan Stanley days uh, ended up being the head of the Ag Investment uh, Division at the Canada Pension Plan Investment Bank, and they had bought a portfolio in Saskatchewan. So I ended up going to Saskatchewan, and we built about 175,000 acre land portfolio there that we predominantly leased cash and crop share out to tenants. And to back up a second, in I had 30,000 acres of corn in Ukraine, and so I had gone through eight Gehringhoff corn heads, and then I went through eight Capella corn heads, and I was never happy with the way that they picked the maintenance I had and the amount of corn I had left in the field. And so I found these guys at Maya in Spain, and I looked them up, and I called Luis, who owns the factory, and I talked to him, and he said, if I make a corn head and it leaves my factory, it'll have a three-year three-year warranty unlimited acre and I said I have 30,000 acres of corn and I have some of the worst combine drivers you've ever seen in your life <laughs> he said if I can't make it good enough out of my factory to do that then it shouldn't have left my factory so I called my brother Lance and I said I'm gonna fly to Barcelona tomorrow I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna go see this guy and Lance said I'll meet you there so he met me we went up spent about three days with him and we bought an eight row before we left the factory shipped to Iowa when we said we're going to go use the hell out of this and see what we think. And so we did, and we liked it enough, said, we're going to go ahead and set up the distribution for North America for it. And that's really how we, how we started with Maya. And so then we started rolling in through Maya, and then as I moved back, took that opportunity to continue to build on the Maya side. And I've always done that as kind of wearing two hats, from the Maya side, the farm side, and, and honestly the farm management side. Hmm. And then to kind of curtail that out, in 2018, I, I had a vision to start a, a fund in the U.S. where I wanted to buy farmland and predominantly transition it to organic, but doing it all through leasing it to local farmers that want to expand their organic operations. And so today, I also have a fund that I manage out of Omaha with a with a full team where we own farmland and lease it to local farm operators that are trying to expand their organic operations. So those are kind of the two hats I wear between, or three, between farming at home the cornhead business and then managing our farmland fund so that's the 30,000 foot view of what's what i do well i think we're good here yeah so well, and we're done and moving on <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot that is a very back. long-winded intro i suppose <laughs> that, but that yeah. resume would rival any guests that we've probably had on this podcast for farming experience where do we start I want to start with Ukraine. I, I want, want to start by promoting Tanner for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know we got to keep these deals going, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the I want to start in Ukraine. You know, it uh, gets reported on a lot. Obviously, well, how about before B- Ukraine? How do you how do you decide that's where you want to go? Like, or you want to farm that? Yeah, what, where I, do you get to that? So I, I tell you what, when I did my I did my MBA, the reason I did it was because. I just felt I was too weak in finance, accounting, marketing after getting an agronomy degree out of Iowa State. I was too too scientific. So you went to California for that? No, I I did. But the reason I did is the first first job I took out of college was I I worked for Novartis uh, working on the dairies and the feedlots on the vaccine side. And I wanted to see if I liked the animal health side. It's just not my fit. My passion was always for farming and crops. Hmm. And so while I was there, I had the opportunity to do my MBA and learn that piece of it when i got done with it i came out with full view of uh, i don't want to work for a i don't want to work for a a big corporate company i want to go do my own thing so i was looking at the idea of going to brazil going back home and the opportunity ukraine just kind of popped in my lap and at the time i looked at it and i thought this is crazy and i did a very minimal amount of research before i went there but i decided you know what i'm going to go try it for a year i kept my house california sold everything i had in it least some friends i said i'll go try it for a year and if it doesn't work i'll be i'll figure out what i want to do next in my life are you married i was not at that time I okay am now so i was gonna say that would uh 
Yeah, Ukraine's not the put a hamper. Ukraine's on. a more enjoyable place to go if you're a young man and you're not married. <laughs> okay, if you're married. Fair enough. Noted. Uh, Noted. All right, so back to Tanner in Ukraine <laughs> and Ukraine, uh, being young well, man. I'm still, I'm still, be, I'm still before that. Like, you didn't grow up like your family just farmed in Emmitsburg, right? Right. And you, they had no connection overseas farming no. anywhere. You just somewhere decided that that was. Well, cool. I tell you what, we. We were involved in Brazil. My younger brother had been in Brazil, and so we were involved in Brazil. So I had spent time in going back and forth to Brazil in the off season to see the farm down there. So I had an interest in it, but more I had an interest for the to travel and go learning about ag someplace else in, yeah. the, in the world. At that time, and if, if we'd have known now what one knows, we could have just gone and bought all the Iowa farmland we could at a price <laughs> point. But at that time, I looked at it and said, you know what? There's got to be huge opportunities in other parts of the world. Yeah to go in and use technology we got, knowledge we got, and go do it better than what other people are doing. So I had this real lust for where is that? Is it? Is it Brazil? Is it South America? At the time, I hadn't really thought about Eastern Europe. And then the Ukraine opportunity came up, and I just felt like it was one of those things of either it would be the worst thing I ever do or it would be the best or the coolest thing I ever do. So being a a world traveler and, and, and wanting to seek out more, did that clue you into Maya? Like, as more comfortable because you were already used to being in other countries and no other operators? and uh, a- Absolutely. I'll tell you what. I, I had a bunch of equipment in Ukraine that I, I would have never used here because you, you bought a lot of your stuff that you'd get out of Western Europe. And so I started going around and, and looking at different equipment. I got to know Michael Horst that makes horse stuff. Went to his farm in Czech Republic and looked at that. I started traveling around looking at all different equipment. And it opened my eyes up to say, Hey, there's a bunch of different brands around the world that are really kick ass. We don't necessarily see them in the States. Because we don't see them here. That's yeah. what I was gathering, yeah. yeah. So that kind of really opened me up to the idea of, hey, there might be something better I can bring back to the States that we don't have here. Interesting. Man. All right. Ukraine, Tanner. It's <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, there's corruption. You know, it, it's one of those environments to where it's always been there. Yes. And the fact or not, whoever you sold the land to knew it was coming or got screwed one way or the other. That was probably because of corruption in one way, shape or form. You, you mentioned checkpoints towards the end for harvest. Tell us a little bit more about how difficult it was to try and bring Western techniques into Ukraine. Yeah, I tell you what, it was hard. So on that first farm, we took at 7,500 acres. Uh, we took it and said, you know what, we're going to try to go no-till this. Because in southern Ukraine, you get about 500 mils or 12, 14 inches of rain. It was a dry land area. You're going to grow sunflowers, winter wheat, winter barley, and and some canola. So we looked at that and said, we're going to go in and try to no-till it because we want to change the system doing it. And it was was hard. So I I remember sitting down with the old old agronomist, had Darren. He took out his his agronomy book, and it was from 19... 77 and I was born in 77 and, and he started going through me about why you plow and why you have to disc and that's basically the doctrine from the Soviet Union of what you've got to do to farm got to be all done in, in straight can't do it in an angle mm. all fields look like an ocean when you go across them and yeah. it takes years to get it out because that was the most efficient from a fuel usage and that's what the doctrine said and so telling him hey we're going to go no-till this everything is a that'll never work here i mean if you've heard it once you've heard it 475 that'll never work in ukraine might work someplace else so you you're just up against all of it of a of a change change is hard anywhere in the world right in ukraine it's it's really hard and then they also look at you as a foreigner you don't speak the language you're this young dumb idiot and in the old days the way i look at it is when you had the community farm system that the Soviet Union had set up where they would go into an area and set up a, a farm and you're going to have chickens and you're going to have dairy and you're in an area, you're going to grow wheat. Here's what you're going to get for fertility and here's the people you're going to have on your farm. That was your system. And so when you go in there and start trying to make big changes to that, everything is just an automatic pushback of how you're going to get there and how you're going to do it. So it, that part was really, really uh, challenging. I remember setting up GPS on, on uh, I had a 60 foot air drill I brought in from uh, South Dakota, from Amity. And these guys telling me, we don't need GPS. That's a stupid technology for the <laughs> Westerners. We, we can drive. And I remember sitting down explaining to these guys, I don't care if you're the best driver in the world. 
if you can look out there, you're either going to be overlapping and leaving a gap, and ultimately you're going to be costing me money. Yep. Yep. And their approach had always been, in my view, is Mother Russia is going to give you X amount of NP and K. They're going to give you seed, and they're going to give you this. Go plant it, and they're going to take their piece, and you're going to get paid for it. A lot of times you come in as a foreign investor, you're just you're just another Mother Russia. It's where do I get my take? There's a great old saying in Ukraine that says, you can steal a semi load of wheat, get away with it, and go on vacation to an island. You can steal a bag of wheat and get caught and, and possibly get hung from a tree. <laughs> is what their view is. You got the you got the small scam stuff they're going to catch. It's the bigger, broader themes of where they can get away doing things, and things are changing and improving over there, but. For my period there, there is a large-scale quantity of, of corruption. So when the Soviet Union fell, they would take a parcel of ground, let's say 100 hectares, 250 acres. Depending where that sat, it was divided into pais. And so if you were in a rich, very productive area, you might have got two hectares. So you might have got five acres. If you were in a poor area, you might have got eight hectares or 20 acres. That was given to the people, and today under the moratorium, that is still owned by the people, so everything is leased. So you rent that 250 acres, you might have 25 landlords. Mm. So you, you farm 135,000 acres, you had, a, you had a room that was 20 by 20 stacked to the wall just full of leases, and a dozen people that did nothing but manage leases because wow. it was all, all paperwork and all process to do that. So right. how important is it to have someone in country on your side so uh let's just go foreign relations wise yep. if somebody was going to come to the united states how important would it be for a ukraine operator to come in, uh, to iowa and farm would they would they want local ties I or think, is that all across the world you yeah, want to have a local you know, on the ground? The, the thing is here you could get away with doing business without any problem without having local ties from uh being able to get someone to do business with you or i'd have to pay them off but even I, I, I farmed one year in Canada, and even in Canada, you show up there, and I had about a 35,000 acre farm that I had asked to take over because of a, of a guy that got himself in trouble. And without having local help, you just don't know the equipment dealers, the suppliers, the people, where to go to market, what you can and can't do, because everything is always a bit different locally. It'd be like if you went today and said, I'm going to go down to Louisiana and go start a farm, you're probably going to find someone local to help you with a whole lot of stuff until you figure it out. It's going to be different help. You don't need someone to help you carve through the legalities of how you're going to weave the system and how you're actually going to be able to get your money in and out and pay things. You can you can do that here easier, but you're going to need the local help in that aspect. When I was in Africa, everybody stole everything, and there was high fence everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now you just mentioned that, uh, just interjecting the conversation there. Did you did you have to worry about your equipment getting stole or oh yeah vandalized or? So when we f we first started in southern Ukraine, I had a I had a 9630 and an 8430T, and I remember one night we got done planting, and it was probably 10 11 o'clock and. I said, we're just going to park them over the backside of a hill. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And all the Ukrainians looked at me like I had just landed from the moon. And I said, <laughs> I said, what did I say? They're like, you're going to leave the equipment here? And I said, well, yeah. They said, well, we might not have anything left in the morning. I said, well, who's even going to find it out here? So the Ukraine process, any time you left anything on the field, you'd leave a security guard on it. You have combines out in the field at Midnight, you're going back to 7 o'clock. Well, the security guard stays with everything out in the field. Otherwise, you'll lose batteries and tires and stuff. I never had a lot of problem with that. I had different problems of theft, but I never had anything stolen too much out in the field. You lose a battery here and there, but ultimately, you just have security guards watch it. Man, so different. So hundreds of thousands of acres over there. I, you don't. There's some big farms in the U.S., but there's nothing like that, right? Like. What what's the sentiment to that over there, or is that just a normal thing? Oh no, that's a normal thing. It's it's such a different system. I knew one I knew one person. He was a Dutch dude. I knew one person had a farm that lived on his farm. For us in the Midwest, everybody thinks about living on your farm. It's where your farm is and your right. is. There, it's much more run like a corporate system. You you go to town at the end of the day. You come back in the morning and you work for the day on your farm. So it's much more corporate. And honestly. Big farms work better, almost better than small farms, because right. they just run, run more like a business with a team of people, and everybody has their job, and, and you're paying a lot less for, for labor. So that that system is very normal. They're the big employers. The average person, big, you can't own land and you only rent land, 
very hard to get the, the debt leverage. You need to go borrow money against it, which is why part of the challenge of going there and operating is about the only thing you borrow money against is your equipment. So if you, if you opened up Ukraine as a great example and sold it to people, and then you could go in and buy that and then leverage it and use that for your operating capital, you'd open up a whole flurry of the amount of money that you could actually put to work and build their economy. Very hard to do on rented land when you have a, when you have a lease on a piece of paper. Uh, so I think when you roll that all together, the average, the average guy like us is not going to go out there and have a thousand acres that they're yeah. farming with their line of equipment. So it virtually is predominantly run corporately and it's pretty well respected and probably a better system. For Did them it all. ever look like it does here or was it just accepted from the beginning that's how it was going to be? For the whole time I was there and going back because of the of the way the farming system done in Soviet Union, that's right. just ultimately the way it has always been. I mean, I imagine before tractors and things of that nature, like you couldn't farm hundreds of thousands of acres no, of horses. No, um, and a lot of that ground just laid un, unfarmed at the that's time. But I will thousand. tell you this, in 2014, I took a picture standing on a hill of a pair of 535 case tractors we had with sunflower discs working. And in the picture on the other side, of the hedgerow there was a guy with a horse and a plow plowing huh. and that is a it wasn't a made-up picture it's a true contrast of what you'd see of a million dollars of equipment out there and a guy still with a with a horse and a huh. plow plowing and those are the guys that keep their two acres and their subsistence farming and they grow their potatoes and they grow their crops that they keep and yep. and keep for for a time like what's now yep. happening in ukraine when i got ready to leave ukraine i had a a friend of mine I went to their place for dinner and they had cabbage sliced out in big buckets. I don't hold me in this number, but I think it was 70 kilograms per person that they had to have going into winter. And I said, well, what's with all the cabbage? And she said, well, you have to have that to go into winter. <laughs> and so as we got talking about it more, the old system and the old mentality from the Soviet Union was, and if you look back in history, back from the Stalin days when they starved 13 million Ukrainians, it was you you keep a supply of something that's going to get you through the winter period. And so there's, I mean, that's changed as well as, as times change. But the old school thought process, that that what happened prior to 93 from whatever, 11 or 1911 or 1913, that, that formulated a lot, of, a lot of things that ride really deep with a lot of people there. Hmm. Man, Whoa. it's so deep. There's a lot of stuff to unpack. So what was it like farming for a hedge fund, right? Because you said you were working for Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Because um, that's how you used, you had access to capital. You talked about how difficult yeah. it was to borrow and expand. You yeah. had a whole fund behind you. Yeah, so whether it's whether it was Morgan Stanley or any other fund, um, Th things things are different when you when whenever you're doing something like that with a fund or an institution, uh, and in that scenario, very very hard place to go and direct operate for anybody. And we are doing that, and there's people in uh, upper management that may be in a in an office in New York that wouldn't know a 1086 from a 4020. Hard when you're trying to explain some of the hey, this is what I'm up to, and uh, I just blew a motor in a combine, and here's what I need. It's hard, hard to do some of that depending on the chain in the process, so it can make things very difficult. It also make things easier in that you have a lot of pull and power when you have big investors behind you, and you also have the access to capital to go get the equipment and the things you need and the inputs you need to go do it. It also teaches you a lot of budgeting and and planning i talk a lot about forecasting midsummer forecast i don't believe today a lot of american farmers go out and do their midsummer forecasts of where they think they're going to be versus their target in their spring and where they're at and where it comes in we, we do we do all midsummer forecasts of where we look at versus budget and what that's going to come out at and you had to do that when the same way in in west ukraine publicly traded company we, we had to give forecasts of where we were going to come in for cor for quarterly numbers those are just things you had to do, and you wanted to do them as accurate as possible because if you're way off wrong yeah, in either missed. direction, it looks bad. Agreed. Yep. <laughs> well, it's the same. Yeah, I like that concept because it's the same way in, in the bank, right? Yep. You, you start with a budget, and then you adjust it on a monthly basis. You provide your quarterly report. But we've started to do, uh, like, August farm visits. You know, you, you get that far into it. You have a pretty good idea of what your crop's going to end up looking like. Now let's compare it to where we set your cash flow. Yep. Just to try and help with perspective. For us on the bank, it's early detection. 
Because if we've got an issue, something that didn't get done like we had originally projected, well, that's our, our first alarm rather than waiting till December after harvest and figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And whenever you're dealing with investors that want and expect a return on their investment, I think it, it, when you're more transparent, more upfront, and more predictive of this is where I think I'm going to be, that is a lot easier than I thought I was going to be here and I ended up here. And honestly, even if you do it and vice versa, people don't necessarily love that. What, so what? Go ahead. What, what's the time frame? So uh, somebody calls you, Morgan Stanley says, hey, we got an idea. We want you to manage a farm. How long did it take you to find the acres, find the equipment? I mean, are you three years before you actually start no, plowing no, the ground? Or like no, how long did that take? You might fall out of your chair when I tell you this, but they, we started talking in like February maybe late January or February I was there in uh, I was there in May I basically resigned what I was doing fire sailed everything I pretty much owned my house in like a week and started looking for equipment and getting around trying to figure out what we were going to ship there and then packed up and and left and went to Ukraine how do you even calculate like shipping's expensive right like I'm going to just ship a tractor or yeah, implement there? you know, you uh, at the time in 2008, you look back at economy, everything was so hot. We looked at it, you couldn't get equipment over there. It was so hard to get stuff. So I looked at it and said, if I want to get Western technology equipment, the best thing I can do is probably go find it here, find stuff that I've got good confidence in, get it containerized. And you look at pretty much everything John Deere makes, it will fit in an eight foot box and you put that in a container. And so we just looked at it saying, at least if we do it that way, we know it's going to cost us ten thousand dollars, eleven thousand dollars, whatever. Get a container to a port and get it here. And I used a I I used a company intermediary uh, that helped me basically work out the logistics. I had a guy here that packed it and paid him. I said part of the deal is you got to come there and help me put it back together because <laughs> we rolled a forty nine twenty out and it took us like a week to put the whole thing back together in order to get that taken apart and put in there. So and there was a lot of it shooting from the hips. I mean I had been I was in Ukraine the first time I went and did the visit three days and, I, and that was from the time I landed and left I mean and we basically spent about 18 hours looking at farms and I looked at three different farms for Morgan Stanley and said two of them are a hopeless cause for me to ever be successful they had a lot of legacy employees and the way that old collective farm system worked is you had all of these people who worked on the farm and so now today when that farm gets consolidated together and you lease it everybody's still there for a job and if a lot of times you let everybody go the village is basically un, unemployed so I wanted to find one that had a limited number of employees because it's the hardest piece of any of that picture to manage. Farmland equipment crops, a lot easier to manage than personnel. Huh. And so the farm we ended up doing that 7,500 acres only had about 12 employees. So. Well, I can't imagine you had like a great dealer network if you're taking all of the stuff. So not only are you taking the tractors and the implements and the combines, you're probably taking containers worth of parts. Yeah, we did. There's a John Deere dealership at the time in, in Ukraine and that was the first experience of me that was new is I went there to get some stuff for the sprayer and they said, well, we didn't sell you that sprayer. And I said, no, I brought it from the States. They said, well, we're not going to sell you parts for it then. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is going to be challenging. So I took the pump out, I had to go to Milan, Italy to deer to get a pump for it to come back. And we actually put it in ourselves because they weren't trained on it and they just didn't want to help you. It was, you buy the equipment here right. and you'll get service here which is a lot different than the equipment dealership piece of a, we want to support our brand and B we want to keep our guys in our shop busy. It's a little different um, over there that has gotten a little bit better because there's a lot of Western equipment has moved into Ukraine over the years. It's still not superb. They ultimately want to sell you the equipment to be able to service it. So a lot of that makes challenges and trying to plan out what you're going to need for parts to go set up a 7,500 acre farm in a foreign country is hard like and we bought a whole lot of stuff like idiots that doesn't work on 110 when you get it there you know air compressors and stuff oh know? yeah oh, that was that was dumb that's not that's yeah. not gonna work um there's a big learning curve there on a bunch of that stuff over time we figured out i actually found out you there's a lot of things that if i wanted it was easier for me to just go to germany and go get westernized things there that i could get very similar here that you can get at that time and bring it back in so you've spent half your life in a different country and half your life here, what's the biggest difference 
in the United States versus anywhere else uh, in the world? The, the United States is just so easy. And I mean, it is just... When I came back from Ukraine, I was like, there's just nothing, there's just nothing to it. I mean, in Ukraine for, A, if you don't speak fluent Ukrainian or Russian, everything you're going to do is trying to be done through a translator. Yeah. You never know if you're getting taken advantage of and, or not. And, and where you're getting hoodwinked on it. You don't know the parts and the supplies which you're getting. You're dealing with everything foreign. Everything is, everything is challenging. Challenges go down and open a bank account. All of that stuff, you need someone to help you with, someone to do. And then you get back to the U.S. And you can call up and do things. Do it in your own language. And most of the time, do something with someone and shake a hand on it, and you're going to get what you need to get. You can go run down the parts store and pick up parts and leave with them. I can go to Ukraine and get five number 19 metric bolts without having a credit account set up with them so it was paid for in advance because they wouldn't let you walk out the door. Like, all of that stuff is just hard. We're here... It's just easy to go do business, and there's a lot of trust that you can actually do when you're doing a deal with people that is just completely different than doing anything in Europe or, or even Africa. I mean, the, the challenges of that are all just so much harder. And we have built things in our economy here, especially in the ag side, for efficiency. I mean, there's a lot of things, whether it's logistically how you move things to grain carts. I, I try to explain to people why you use grain carts because I can reduce the number of combines. And the only thing everybody would tell you is you can't unload a combine on the go. It'll break the auger out off. <laughs> it's impossible. And, and that whole mentality, of, well, there's efficiencies we're trying to do here because I don't want to add more combines. I want to add right. more grain carts. All of that stuff we're built to do. We're built for size, equipment, our roads, all of that stuff. You want to take a tractor down the road, with duels on it, it's over the legal width to go down. So you have to go pay a police escort to move everything you want to go Jeez. do. Or you have to move it in the middle of the night to get through town. It's like, we're just built differently to make business easier. Right. right. Wow. I, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if I've ever seen a gleaner unload on the go. <laughs> 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 that might be true for them. <laughs> probably don't ever see a gleaner with a Maya head on either because it'd be too oh, there is there is a few too much there, grain into it it wouldn't be able to handle it. there is a few gleaners with Maya heads and they work quite well that's funny uh i wanted to ask about the efficiencies that you just alluded to what how what did you learn as you ran farms of that scale that would translate to our listeners as to what where a tipping point is on an efficiency level is it how do you know when it's time to go to a second combine? How do you know when it's time to add a second grain cart? What what did you do to discover those efficiencies? Yeah, so the way the way we did it, it was the only way at the time I I could figure out to do it because I was kind of shoot from the hip on the process was we would sit down and basically make a Gantt chart and let's say in in the fall or, or over the winter months, we would make a Gantt chart out of every field we had, every operation we had planned we were going to do on it, what tractor was going to be on it, what drill was going to be on it. In, in Lviv, for example, Western Ukraine, we figured about a 55% time we would be down for, for rain because you got a lot, of, a lot of rain came off the Carpathian mountain rains, heavy soils. So you took in a, a calculation for your downtime for that, breakdowns, and then you, you basically built out exactly, in theory, what was going to happen on everything across the board. And you ultimately backed into, because land was our, our cheapest piece. I think we were renting land $39 an acre. So land was not your expensive part of the equation. It was ultimately, how do I maximize out the maximum amount of acres I can get out of equipment? And then you'd start with, what's the most expensive thing I've got? It's probably going to be combines. So what is the maximum number of acres I can get through combines? And what's that going to look like versus lease combines? So I have 26 combines here. How am I going to maximize those? And at one point, we bought four New Holland combines, and basically, it curtailed all the way back through the system of, well, we're going to add X number of more acres because we're going to maximize the efficiency there. We've got, a, we've got efficiency in drills, and we can spread out our crop rotation, which is why you end up with that 5-6 crop rotation, is how do I spread that all across? And for us, it ultimately came down to a Gantt chart of time of what was going to be done and how to get the highest number of acres and throughput through the most expensive piece of equipment and then back trail back. And so that was always our tipping point of, Hey, we're going to give up this farm because it's not producing. We can't physically get a combine. Yeah. Or if we had one that we didn't like because the production wasn't good enough, then you cut that farm. And you might say either I got to replace it or I'm going to cut some equipment. 
Tanner, I think half our listeners are Googling how to move to Ukraine to rent ground. <laughs> well, for I don't third. know about that with the, what's going on now. It would probably not be the greatest time to go there today. Yeah. So, so if you take what you've learned and, and say we're sitting on, on Corey's farm and he's running right now one combine, one grain cart, and, and a couple of trucks, working on a, a brand new updated or uh, upgrades to his grain facility to be able to take it away from that machine. You know, I look at my family's operation, and I'm, the first pinch point that I can see on expansion is they're running one combine, one cart, is they need a second cart to keep the combine running. My ex right. Most expensive piece of equipment, let's keep it running the entire time, rather than what my father-in-law believes is they just need a second combine. Yeah. And, and I, you know, so that's interesting, th your thought process. It feels like it kind of aligns with. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And that, that was why we bought a lot of grain carts, because we were sitting there. And the first harvest, I was like, this is absolutely absurd. Everybody wanted to go drive up to the end and dump in a truck. And a lot of times, your Ukrainian operators would drive down, and they'd turn around and drive halfway back across the field till it was full, and they'd turn around and drive all the way back and dump in a truck. And for us, you just look at that, and you're like, this is this is absolutely crazy. To answer your point on Corey's farm, he can expand as much as he wants. He's got a 12-year-old Maya corn head. The guy can probably <laughs> farm 10,000 acres of corn and get it done. 10,000 acres of corn. And have uh, limited downtime. And have limited downtime. That's it, exactly it, right. It's almost like you didn't need an agronomy degree. You needed to go for like a systems engineer, process engineer, like just to sit back and go, what's the most efficient way to do this? I think one of the things that taught me like in Ukraine was I went into it with a uh, a real agronomy crop approach of their productions for what their yields were at, at that time, let's say it was uh, a little over uh, two tons of wheat to the hectare, about 30, 35 bushel an acre. I look at that as you get some of the best producing farm ground in the world with some of the highest fertility. We're going to go in and focus on agronomy and how to grow big crops. The reality is I could hire a really good agronomist to go out and be a really good agronomist and help do that. It's more of the entire systems approach of how do you manage the business, the cost, where's the best place to put your money, and how do you maximize equipment in order to get across all of that. That to me is is you is basically trying to find your your best use for your time. And how do you, how do you value that out? And for me, it, even though I really enjoy the part of going out and doing the crop side, it wasn't the best use of my time. It was more of taking the higher approach of. How do we build the systems, the approaches, and the business in to try to make that so we can be the highest efficiency and ultimately the highest profitability? Yeah. Yeah. So as you, it's was it Emmitsburg or Estoril? Emmitsburg. Emmitsburg. So have you and your brother taken what you learned managing these extremely large farms and brought it back? You probably farm all of that county. Now. No. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's he's 120,000 acres. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, we farm Palo Alto and Kasuth. No. Um, there are things we've taken out of it that has absolutely helped us, but it's it's a way different system when you're farming 2,500 acres than what you're looking at doing that. So your your efficiency piece of going to what I would call a corporate fized farm up north of 100,000 acres, it, it just goes, it's almost less of being a farmer and it is of how to run my business and my systems and my approach and my team and what are my shifts going to look like for how I'm going to do that. Is I mean, the anybody working... in Iowa that have 100,000 acres? Mm, I don't, they don't own I, even even that much. The operate, highest, manage. Isn't the highest ownership in Iowa, like 50,000 some acres? I don't know. I don't know. By the Brook family? I should know that. I wish it was the Brook <laughs> I, wish it was the, I wish it was the Brook family. It is, it is not. Um, so there are things that I think we, we learned out of it. Uh, a lot of good things. But they're, they're just a lot different approach than the way you're going to go yeah. farm where you're ultimately yep. going to spend time in a tractor seat, time doing those things. You, you're going to do it a different scale yep. and a different approach. One thing fun about going to someplace like Ukraine or Brazil or place is there is no place in the U.S. you're going to go farm 100,000 acres. Right. I love the aspect of the learning. I always said I picked up more in the first six months in Ukraine than I did in two and a half years of doing my MBA, and I thought I learned a bunch there. And then you get there and you really learn about doing budgets and timing yeah. and planning and systems and how you're really going to approach everything and managing people. That's a whole different change. Yeah. So. Crazy. So we farm like 40s, 80s, 120s, you know, whatever. Are the fields just huge there? Most of them. You can get Western Ukraine. You can get a lot of a lot of roll. There's still some ground today being cleared that's in 
uh, it's really grown up into bushes and trees yeah. over time from not being farmed. So you find some of that smaller, but down in, yeah, in southern Ukraine, I mean, uh, I think our biggest field was 400 hectares, so about 1,000 acres. Okay. Uh, but Brazil is where you get the really monstrosity okay. stuff. But, yeah, you can get a lot of stuff in that 500 to 1,000 acres where you can, you can go out and get a lot done. Hmm. So we've beat on Ukraine quite a bit, but we probably need to get on to the next subject. But I do, we wouldn't be right if we didn't ask. You have no, nothing there in Ukraine now. Correct. And so what is your, I'm, I'm sure you're still tied, know some people. What's your opinion of what's going on there now? Um, or what's it look like? Yeah, so I, you know, I've got the guy that took over that runs the farm that I left, uh, who had worked for me the whole time there. I, I talk to you often, and uh, and I've got a lot of friends still in Ukraine. Yeah, you know it's a it's a travesty for the Ukrainian people and what's going on, and it's a it's a giant shit show. Um, at the end of the day, for everybody on the on the east half, on the west half of the country, things are people are getting by. I mean, people are able to operate and do things, but uh, it's a, it's a terrible travesty. For what happens there I, I have a lot of questions about sending unlimited amount of money to a country like ukraine as a government because after spending seven years of living and working there full time i know what happens to money when it shows up there a lot of times so i think that i personally have a lot of questions about that and the process of how that should go but at the end of the day it's uh it's ultimately it's just it's a travesty for the people that are there so corruption runs it's, it's normal there, but it runs deep, and I think we have probably quite a bit of corruption as well. It's just hidden, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, if we're doing that kind of stuff, so it's kind of yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, it's 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 and it's in different ways. What's Russia's? I mean, did they know that was going to happen? I mean, what's their goal? Just they want the <clears throat> commodities? Yeah, I think um, I think they're I think they look at at Ukraine and the productivity. In the, in the potential of what that productivity is, one. Number two, when they took Crimea, they virtually came across the Kerch Bridge and just showed up, and no one really did anything about it. And then they had a they had a vote, and, and Crimea was in was, it was uh, an independent republic or however they had labeled it, which virtually meant they could hold a vote to, to leave. And so they held a vote, and amazingly, like 99% of the people, allegedly, Hmm. voted to voted to leave they they had a a very corrupt election they just basically said this is what's going to happen and on the flip side uh you can look at that and say i i believe at that time the the retirement money for a retired ukrainian like your social security is around 140 dollars a month in russia at that time it was about 560 dollars a month oh. so if you happen to live in crimea you speak russian as your native tongue you were part of Russia prior to. Have you ever retired and you looked at that and said, virtually nothing's going to change in my life, but my income's going to go up by $400 a month. Mm -hmm. Might not be the worst decision for you at that point if you're sitting there depending where you're, where you're where at. Would go. There is a complete different patriotic <laughs> view when you were in Ukraine from where the Dnieper River splits, which kind of comes down through Kiev and comes all the way down and splits down. Mm -hmm. You're on the east side, everybody spoke Russian. You're on the west side everybody spoke ukrainian i started to learn russian when i got down to southern ukraine i got to western ukraine uh and walk and say good morning to him and they respond to you back in ukrainian and there's a whole bunch of words that are not the same and yeah. they're not going to speak to you and they're literally not going to answer you in in russian because of that mentality. even though they all speak it they're not huh. going to and it's a pride piece and today that pride piece has grown across ukraine where Nobody's going to speak Russian, and everybody is flying the flags yeah. and and proud of it. So that demeanor has probably changed. But at the end of the day, I think uh, I think Russian sees it for productivity. I also think they figure the first go around in Crimea was awful simple. Let's just take more. Yeah, let's let's just take more. So uh, bullies often have a tendency to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday was the first time I ever saw a war in a cornfield, but uh, <laughs> uh, here at the Progress Show, they a house landed. harvest. Yeah. Yeah. Made, yeah, yeah. Made front page. Made front page in the news. Yeah. I, I, think, I think I missed that. You flew, did. A, flew a Chinook helicopter in right over here and corn pieces everywhere in yeah. there. Awesome. Yeah. yeah so cool. we were over at the Sukut booth just right away from where it was happening, and all of a sudden you're hearing gunfire. 
<laughs> and yeah, and there's like, hmm. I hopped up on the grain bin and there's just you, militant you smell, people in the field. You could smell gunpowder. Yeah, yeah, you could smell gunpowder and you could hear it. And uh, we're like, what the heck's going on? You, yeah. you look over there and then there's, they've got smoke bombs. Yep. yep. That they're, you know, setting up a smoke screen. Yep. So that was kind of interesting. That is unique. Mock did, war in a cornfield. Did you speak, do you speak fluent no. Ukraine? No. No. I do not. No. So you what, always what, had what? to have a translator? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I learned my, I learned my ag terminology well enough that I could go out, set up a combine, talk to agronomist. I could do that piece. I can read it well enough to go sit down at a restaurant and order off a menu and figure it out. If someone sits down in the bar next to me and wants to talk about politics or yeah. life, my vocabulary uh, was not good enough <laughs> to get done. So, Rick. What do so you want, Rick? Ricky Bobby. <laughs> so as we, as we do look at you know, finishing up this episode, I want to see how bringing Maya to America has has done for you. You know, is it? Uh, you're obviously here. Corey's, yep. Corey's got the the head. A lot of guys are running it and liking it. How has been bringing America, bringing Maya to America, done? It's been awesome, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. It's it's been uh, it's been some learning by all means on our side of what it takes to to set up a business like that and import equipment and build it and set up dealers and go through it. But we were fortunate in the essence of, and we've often said, we have a great product. Like our product mechanically has stood up extremely well. We've been doing this for 10 years. We've got heads in 15 different states. Our heads mechanically have stood up very well, worked well. Um, our customer retention is is close to 100%, so we've done very well on that aspect. So having a good product makes that a lot easier. Well, one thing is different is when you, for me, is you look at a lot of different businesses that you could start, and when you start something like this business, you're importing stuff, you end up finding yourself with a half million dollars of parts inventory because you can't have someone break down and say, I need this and I'll get it from Spain. We have to have it. So there's a lot of things like that where the, until you get to a size economy of scale, you can smooth some of that out. It honestly hurts your hurts your bottom line, and there's a bunch of that stuff we didn't honestly think through as well when we set it up and did it. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'd know a hell of a lot more about the way to go about and do it. At the time, we just looked at it and said, this is going to be a kick-ass product. It's going to be something different. We can sell it at a, at a lower price to the American farmer, and we're going we're gonna to go bring something that's new to the market. And so we were gung-ho and just said let's jump in and go yeah. is it still changing like every time i go to a farm show it's like oh we got this new or got that new or we added a bell and a whistle to it something like that you guys have been out for a while yep. are they constantly trying to make it better i mean it, it seems better what i've heard yep. is already better than some of the the solutions we have here do they just say we're better when we started or do we keep trying to No, it's if you when we first brought our first cornhead and we didn't have hydraulic deck plates we had metal snoots because that's what Europe that's what Europe wanted. Yep. Um, and so Luis, who's the who's the owner of the factory, he's about our age, engineer and his brother's an engineer. He came over that first fall and basically spent about ten days riding around. And he said, Okay, I see a bunch of things that are different in the US market that the American farmer wants that we don't do. I'm gonna go home and so Every single year he has had things that he's improved. We've changed the size of our auger, for example, because we found on 16 rows, we want we wanted to move, move it quicker to the feeder house. Uh, we've changed the plastic, we've improved different things. So we're always looking at it as improving. At the end of the day, we're not engineers. Uh, we're, a bunch of, we're a bunch of farmers and entrepreneurs. Yep. But what, what we're able to do is we had a great relationship with the engineers and we make him, he's over in the summer and he's over in the fall. And he loves to go around and ride around with farmers and say, what, what don't work? you like yeah. about this? What can I do better? And I'm going to go back and make it better. And he's got a vision of his dad started it and his brother run it. He's got kids that he wants to be the next generation to do it. So it's a family business on their side, and it's all about improving. And I think the last piece on that that I, I like about it for what we do is he just makes corn heads. We don't make bean heads and planter parts and we don't do anything corn heads and it is solely focused every day on everything on one individual product which allows us to put a lot of focus and put everything we make on it that goes back into it and everything he makes on it goes into one product and that's that's corn heads 
And I think that's that's kind of unique compared to what a lot of industries have and do. Probably limits you on your total revenue of what you generate because you may generate different things and sell in different seasons, but that's okay for us. Uh, we want to have one product and be the best at it. All right, guys, I only have one more question, and then I'm done. How do you have just one question? <laughs> just one. Just one. And it's, I, I and can't it, wait. For I have truly hit. bored the shit out of no, him. No, I, I cannot <laughs> wait for him to be our second, third Pete guest. Yeah. Uh, I, honestly, yeah, because there's a the whole investing and, and fun thing. I, we can't even touch in this show. It's going to have to – I think that's a profit show. Yeah. yeah. I, I would love to – I would love to. Uh, it's going to be an excuse to get him to the studio. Yeah, I had yeah. a guy call me yesterday. I think we should record in Spain. Ooh. Hey, we could do it in. Uh, we could do it. We could do it. Or we could do it in January or February. We go <laughs> over there, see the factory, <laughs> and go tour it. It's absolutely awesome. There we go. That would be um, wild. Sorry, somebody called you yesterday. So I had a, I had a guy, young guy, call me yesterday, and he said I'm, I'm trying to expand. I do not have enough money to buy ground. I got 875 acres coming up around me. And I know a bunch of people that have money. I don't know how to explain to them the benefit of why to buy farmland. Yeah. They look at a cash yield and say, mm -hmm. oh, three, three and a half percent cash yield. That's not exciting. I'll go, I'll go buy a house in LA and rent it on an Airbnb. Yeah. So I started trying to explain to him some of the things of appreciation, deductions, long-term growth. And there's a, that's a, that's a two hour long conversation to have just on that piece of really understanding deeper of what it is besides what's going on in farmland for people that actually want to understand that. That's a, that's a fun conversation to have on the depth of that and what that, what that means and how someone like an institution looks at that as an asset class for real assets versus what they would look at an apartment building or an energy plant mm -hmm. or, or anything else. So that's probably for another You're day. You're getting Dave's pants tight over there. <laughs> 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 that's that's his that's that's his uh yeah, that's my game alley there i love it <laughs> had nothing to do with my question though <laughs> <laughs> right. you got more cory um how many heads have you sold or how many do you sell a year or is that a proprietary yeah. no um we're going to sell about 60 this year 60 uh and we're predominantly going to be i mean nebraska iowa illinois indiana is our is our core market, yeah, and and that is the core Corn Belt market. You know, we're in South Dakota, Minnesota. We do pretty well in, uh, and now this year we've got heads on dealerships all the way down to Texas uh, for the North Panhandle. So we're expanding out a bit on that side, but really the the Midwest is our heart business, and and that twelve row folding chopping is really our our flagship head. That's a vast majority of what we sell. Why What's do you th why do you think it's not more? Because and, and I'm asked that because I I found you guys and I don't even know how I found you. It's probably Rick on some website. I don't know, but uh, I saw the value in it. Yep. And then did it, and I love it. And then I, and I just by happen chance had a really crappy situation with the derecho. Yeah. And had an awesome advantage that way, and I just want to so, know why so, not so, more. So, so the reason it's not more is honestly when. Um, we can't first, make that many more, can you? It was just a production yeah. issue, ultimately. And so it starts off, it's the chicken and the egg. Like, he didn't have the production, and we didn't have the sales. And we went through this period where he was growing his production from 12 heads a year that he could ship to the U.S. Because his core market has always been Europe, and you got to protect your, your core business. Yeah. And then it was 20, and then 25, and 30. And then about two years ago, he basically built... A factory just like the factory's got doubled it and now he's in the process of finishing another one so his factory would be triple the size added a lot more shifts added a lot more robots and equipment and so you know next year next year we should have about 85 heads into the country and so he's continuing to build his market in europe but a lot of it has just been supply and then in the early days it was oh we didn't know what we were doing and, and we weren't able to sell them and then you run into a point where we were sold out sold out sold out and we have been fortunate, knock on wood, to basically every every year be able to sell all the heads we've we've got, which is is great great piece to be. I I would love to be at the point of saying, well, we're sold out for next year and the year after. But honestly, I like the fact that we're able to get enough to service the market to people yep. who we want to sell. So ultimately, it's been it's been supply, and it, at some point, those will toss back and forth between the amount of supply you can get and the amount of sales you can get. We have we have lost some opportunities with some different groups. Because we honestly just couldn't. <laughs> oh boy, uh, our golf cart's gone now, and they brought gas. The, 
they got gas. Have they been drinking? That's the question. No, uh, uh, we we're the golf cart's almost out of gas. Um, and we have we have honestly lost some opportunities to link up with some some big dealers to sell a lot of corn hits because yep. they just simply said if you can't give us a bigger volume, it's not worth us right. getting there. So. Yeah. So, so why corn heads and not anything else? I'm sure you ran into other products that had a similar thing like that. that we did. Question. You know, I, honestly, when we got into the, we wanted a, my brother Lance wanted a folding corn head yeah. on the farm because he said, I'm sick and tired of taking a corn head on and off all the time. And so we were looking at folding corn heads um, and we looked at Capella and I, I'm not at all here to knock Capella. They make a good, they make a good corn head. We looked at them, we looked at the price, and then I had eight of them in Ukraine. And um, at the time in Ukraine, I'm just going to tell this quick story. The front idler on a Capella corn head was Polly. Oh. And I said to the guy, I said, these are Polly. And he said, you won't change those in the next three years. I think that first fall we went through about 104 or five. My guys <laughs> got to the point, it was like NASCAR changing tires. Yeah. Now, granted, we combined corn until the 15th of January. The ground was frozen. We didn't have auto level on there and guys would hit the ground and it would look like a golf ball and so i went through and stuff and i said hey if you're gonna buy a folding corn head i wouldn't buy their corn head right now because i'm not super happy with them and i got eight of them right here yeah. today so then finding these guys and he folded his first corn head in 1993 and he did it he folded a six row for the european market and so we went and started talking to him in 13 or tw late 12 early 13 we said well do you have folding and he said I was folding a corn head before anybody in the market folded a corn head. And so I looked at that and I was like, all right, he's figured that out so we can get a folding head here. And that was part of my, and the down corn units. There's 39 corn head manufacturers in the world today. And he's the only one that I've ever found that has a down corn unit that you can take off, put on, and runs right off your gearbox. You don't need any hydraulics, you don't need that to do that. And they work, and it's better than a corn reel. And as we hit bigger yields and more wind and more weather, right. as you've seen the trade yep. show, every single year we have some place where we have a bunch of down corn. And we don't like to sell our corn heads being the down corn, down corn, corn head. I think it's a great corn head, standing corn. But I love the fact when someone calls us up and says, I got a thousand acres of disaster, I don't know what to do. Tell them, well, you know what? We, got it. we have a solution for you. And that's honestly, it's also yeah. a really good feeling when you can right. do that, when you yeah. can do that for a farmer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was looking at another corn head company that I liked a lot of their agronomic things. They had some longer row units. The corn head ran flatter. It was supposed to be better, you know, for uh, getting kernels into the head. And then Maya had a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And then some. Mm -hmm. So we have a we have a long row unit. We try to run about a 17 degree angle. So it's that concept of instead of picking that ear and having it come up vertical, have it come in as flat as you can have a long row unit and try to use the whole thing. So you get your plants down through there, which allows you to slow your head down. So you don't have to take that ear off right on the front. I think you take some of those features. We are chopping blades run at a 15 degree down angle. And I, first time I went through the factory, I said to Luis, I said, why are the chopping blades at down angle? And he said, well, because I built a 20, 20 inch corn head and they hit. Wow. So he said, I put them in a down angle. And then he said, I realized after I did it, it takes less power and it doesn't wind row anything underneath the head. So he said, I kind of stumbled into it and found out it's a it's a really good design piece to do it. So I think there's just a bunch of those oddity things that are, they're important if you're trying to get every single bushel yeah. into a combine, um, they're important to have. Hmm. Is, do you think there would ever be a time that they would have production in the States? Or is we, it more yeah, no, we, we, we've, we've talked a lot about it and we've basically said to Luis, we want to get to a point where we either are assembling or or manufacturing in the Midwest, um, because ultimately we feel like that's that's a step we're gonna get to. Our shipping got crazy during COVID. I mean, yeah. we're paying, went from paying $6,000 a container to paying $20,000 a container and not being able to get them and then having to pay to merge because they didn't have truckers to deliver mm -hmm. up on their account. And and that gets really, really expensive. And ultimately it's, it's bad for the farmer because uh, we, we want to keep our price point as absolute low as possible. I think right. one of the fun things for us, and I think there's probably other people that have it, is Lance, I, and Rick that own the business are all farmers. And so there there isn't a feeling of I'm going to gouge the shit out of everything I can. Yeah. And we want to make money on what we're doing, yeah. but we all also want to be real, realistic. And, we know, and we know that you know how to run a business. Yes, right? and I think I think we've been successful in running a business and making that yep. profitable and, and doing that. So. 
Awesome. Wow. I got I got one more. <laughs> I get why you and Lance are in the business. How the heck did you find this guy? Well, and how is he an owner? Um, <laughs> we were at this bar in Tijuana, and I'm, this I'm guy walks to in. Rick. Oh, <laughs> I, I figured. You <laughs> anyway, this guy walks without a shirt on. No, uh, just out of college. When I mentioned earlier, I had worked for worked for Novartis on the pharmaceutical side. Uh, Rick was as well, and so uh, we were all young, driving around the road, uh, learning how to sail and learning learning how to do sales and business and meeting people. And we just we became became friends and got to know each other over the years. And then when I was in Ukraine, stayed in touch. And we got back to the cornhead. And I don't know how it came about, but I was talking to Rick one day about our cornheads, and he said, "Well, bring one down here. I'm going to run it." And so he came down and run it. And I think he said to me that his dad said to him, "You need to get involved with this business because this this is going to go somewhere." And Oh, I remember we went down to Texas. Lance and I and Rick went down to Texas. We'd sold some corn heads down there. And Rick went with us, and we basically had this conversation about, you don't want to work for Maya. They didn't want you want. You want to be a partner in the business because you know where it's going to go. And it's honestly, we have a great set of skill sets, in my opinion, which I think every business needs. Is Lance is very, is very technical and very good with the corn head and setting it up, and he knows everything in and out on it. Rick is very good at sales and enjoys that part and likes to go out and do that piece. And I like to be on the business side because of the hats I'm wearing of what's going on with the business, the books, the financing, right. and where we're going. And so I think we all look at it as a different approach. I can say in 10 years, we have never had a decision where we had a powwow and couldn't come to a term out. Like we, we can always sit down and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking and here's why. And we may have disagreements on it, but it, it makes a nice combination, honestly, in a, in, in a partnership to me. Having a good partnership where everybody's got a different skill sets, you guys have the exact same process. Yep, yep. To me, that's, that's, what makes a, that's what makes a good business and makes it hum. And I, I, I love the whole entrepreneurship piece. I think every, every American farmer is an entrepreneur, and I love that piece of having a business and mm -hmm. going out and trying to figure out things you got to make it right. grow so that's how ricky also known as ricky bobby ricky bobby showed up on the on the scene and we got to have someone to laugh at once in a while it is fun that's to do right. that that's yeah. my all right favorite. tanner before you close i got to, i'll ask my one question that i had <laughs> left <laughs> tanner's just he's beside it's, himself I, I never got to ask it so <laughs> it you, you have uh, uh, awesome gravel in your voice. And so when I auctioneer, sometimes like, I burned him here, now here, I, you know, it's like deep in there. Is that vodka? Like, what was it that put the, <laughs> like, what put the gravel in your voice? It uh, it probably did have a little bit to do with vodka. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you guys this is that you talk about vodka, something fun. So if you, hey, you could buy a good bottle of vodka better than anything you're going to drink here for about two and a half Two and a half dollars for a liter of vodka in Ukraine. Part of the problem with a little bit of the drinking issue sometimes in Ukraine. But if you went out with a group of us and we were going to go out and sit down for dinner, you'd get a, a vase, basically a vodka, come out a liter of cold vodka and some fruit and shot glasses and pour yourself a shot and drink vodka and maybe chase it with a beer or drink a beer. But you just sit down and drink vodka all night. And I remember I, I was there and I, I went to this little cafe. It was like 10 o'clock at night. We were harvesting and I came in and I was all dirty, which is not socially acceptable really in Ukraine. Uh, if a girl's going to walk downstairs and get a gallon of milk, she's going to be dolled up to the nines because that's that's what you do. Hmm. And so I roll in there, dirty, semi-embarrassed, and there's four beautiful women dressed up like they're going to a prom sitting at this table in this little cafe. And they have a glass liter of vodka sitting on the table and i'm like boy i'll tell you what you wouldn't walk in and marry very many little cafes in <laughs> iowa and see four women dressed to the nines drinking a, a liter of vodka <laughs> and then they ordered a second one oh. and i was sitting there and i was like well this is gonna get interesting <laughs> and i thought well maybe they maybe i'm just an amateur <laughs> they're professionals and then they they almost had to crawl out of the <laughs> crawl out of the place and crawl into a car but i remember thinking there's a culture shock that you're just not going right. to see everywhere around the world <laughs> which which is good. I think we all got to get culture shocks once in a while. So it's going to make you it's going to make you better and better understanding of how okay. things work here. So, I love it. I am going to wrap it. We're going to ask the same question we ask everybody else. What do you enjoy the most about working with farmers? Oh, I love the uh, 
I love the authentic ability of being able to and talk to someone that loves what they're doing and it's a lifestyle, not a job, and they're passionate about it, knowledgeable about it, entrepreneurial to be in doing what they're doing, and they're honestly trying to do something that is good for everybody in this country and around the world from a food growing standpoint. So yeah. I love that authentic piece of that where you can just shake someone's hand and it's, it's a different piece than any other industry I've ever seen in the world. And I'm sure there's other industries that have that authentic piece. I just don't know one. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's a great answer. Thank you guys. Yeah. This is fun and it'll, it'll happen again because it has to, the, the knowledge that you have and uh, it'd be fun to do, to do three parts, right? Get them in the studio for part two and then go to Spain for part three. There we go. Let's do it. I think uh, I think that would be great. But Corey, as we wrap this baby up, what do you say? I just say crack a bush light. Not a liter of vodka. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs>